President Bylock, it is my honor, in the presence of the trustees, faculty, staff, students, and distinguished guests of Barnard College, to declare this 2022 convocation ceremony now open. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Cheryl Glicker Milstein, a proud Barnard alumna from the class of 1982, a proud parent of Toby, class of 2014, and chair of the Barnard Board of Trustees. I am delighted to be here today to bring you greetings from the board. I've had the fortune of welcoming Barnard students at several convocations now. And I always make sure to point out just how long and significant a role Barnard has played in my life. I do this to plant the seed in your minds that Barnard is more than just a four-year experience, that it's more than a stop along the path to your careers and future selves. If you allow it to, Barnard will become a regular feature in your lives for many decades to come. It will stand by you forever, providing social and professional connections, career resources and guidance, boundless learning opportunities, a family for life, and a whole lot of fun. And if, like me, your own child becomes a Barnard student and alumna one day too, the college truly becomes a core part of your long-term identity and legacy. But the close ties I've kept with Barnard throughout my adult life has also given me a front row seat to just how much the college and its students have changed over the years. And as much as I cherish my Barnard ties, every time I stand up here welcoming new and returning students, I am also secretly a little bit jealous. Well, the secret's out. And I have a reason for sharing it with you this year. But first, let me explain that the roots of my envy aren't necessarily what you'd expect. It's not that I wish to be in college again. I've had too many of those nightmares where you're registered for, you're in a, in a final and you don't remember being registered for a class. I don't want that again. And as I've already told you, Barnard prepares you to be ever evolving. The success, and happiness and satisfaction that I've derived at each stage of my life, studies and career, are due in no small part to what the experiences at Barnard taught me about being curious, daring, and ever evolving as a person and a thinker. I've already told you that I've never quite left Barnard, so it's not a question of missing it. I've loved every role I've played at Barnard, student, alumna, parent of a student and alumna, board member, Barnard chair, and I wouldn't change a thing. So where does my envy come from? Here it is. Getting to know so many incredible students over the years, seeing their values and expectations change, watching whole new generations fearlessly confronting the world's greatest challenges, and taking aim at traditions rooted in old ways of thinking about gender, sexuality, social roles. Witnessing the college's extraordinary advances in the sciences and the multidisciplinary creativity and drive of each new cohort of students, I am just consistently blown away. And I've never seen as much courage, determination, and adaptability and transformation as I saw in the last two years. The COVID-19 pandemic didn't put Barnard on hold. In fact, just the opposite. The passion and innovation of Barnard students and faculty led to new programs, new courses, new avenues for connection and support, and new ways of thinking that have made an already one-of-a-kind world-class institution into an even more extraordinary place to live and learn. What would it be like, I wonder, to be coming to Barnard for the very first time? What would it be like to be a Barnard student in 2022 
with the whole world at your fingertips in ways my classmates and I could never have imagined. And with a fresh, deep perspective on the world we're in and the hopes and challenges ahead. I envy the perspective that you will have as Barnard students that none of you have had before. It's a perspective I believe will inspire you to become the change makers the world needs right now. And I believe that Barnard is the best place in the world for you to build the skills, discover the passions, and meet the friends and peers that will take you to where you want to go. I don't want to turn back time, but I'm jealous of the power you all have to change the future. And I can't wait to see what happens. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy Veltman, class of 1989 and president of the Alumni Association of Barnard College, the AABC, and an alumni trustee. As we welcome you, the first year students, I imagine you're thinking that graduation is impossibly far away and perhaps the end of your Barnard experience. I can assure you, neither is true. Upon your graduation, a new rewarding phase of your relationship with Barnard will be just beginning as you automatically become a member of the AABC, the Alumni Association of Barnard College. No requirements, just electives. As an AABC member, you'll have a lifetime of opportunities to learn, socialize, receive career support, and to give back to the students who follow in your footsteps. Perhaps best of all, you'll do so alongside multiple generations of fascinating, bold Barnard alums living all over the world. On behalf of the AABC, the Alumni Association of Barnard College, it is my honor and joy to welcome you to the Barnard family. Hi everyone, my name is Sania El Amin and I graduated in 2016 and now serve as chair of the Young Alumni Committee on the AABC. Like many of my fellow alums, my path since graduating has not been linear at all. It has been filled with many twists, turns, and new discoveries that have helped guide me to where I am today. But even as I continue finding my way and helping others along the way, I'm so comforted to know that the entire Barnard community has been and always will be there for me. What I hope you'll take away from my story today is that it's never too early to seek guidance from those who have been where you are right now. There are more than 37,000 Barnard alums all around the world with interests and expertise spanning all sorts of disciplines. And we are forever proud to support you. On behalf of the entire AABC, I join Amy in welcoming all of you to our family. I hope that you savor these student years and never hesitate to reach out to your, young, to your alum community. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Bell, Provost and Dean of the Faculty. I'm truly honored to be here with all of you today. Each year, we gather, gather for convocation to inaugurate the new academic year and in celebration of our return to scholarly life. This year, for the first time since 2019, we celebrate convocation in person with the entirety of the Barnard community. Students from all class years, faculty, staff, alumni, and members of the Board of Trustees. I am truly delighted to see you all here today to have the full Barnard community together, united under one beautiful roof. In this room are thought leaders whose ideas 
are not only shaping what we know about the world, but the direction it is taking. Our truly amazing faculty who are dedicated to teaching and to ensuring that you learn are renowned scholars, members of their national academies, Guggenheim Award winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, Carnegie Foundation Fellows, recipients of prestigious grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, from the National Science Foundation, from the National Institutes of Health, among others. They are leaders in their scholarly fields and they're devoted teachers and mentors. They will inspire and support you throughout your time at Barnard. And you should take full advantage of their classes to learn to the fullest, to actively engage and challenge. We are now all acutely aware of how pre precious a privilege it is to gather together in an academic space. So I encourage you to take full advantage of the opportunity of in-person learning that you have in front of you this academic year. In her novel, The Lowland, Barnard alumna and newly appointed Millicent C. McIntosh Professor of English and Director of Creative Writing, Jhumpa Lahiri, tells the stories of lives undone by tragedy and forged anew through perseverance. She writes, and I quote, most people trusted in the future, assuming that their preferred version of it would in fact unfold, blindly planning for it, envisioning things that weren't the case. Our community has learned a great deal from the experiences of these past years, chiefly that our preferred vision of the future is far from promised. What we expect, what we plan for, may be completely upended by forces beyond our control. You know this. You have lived this most recently. Rather than trusting in the future, Barnard students, I charge you, I urge you, to trust in yourselves, to enable yourselves a future perhaps not yet revealed. You have risen to previously unthinkable challenges these past academic years, and you now know that you can rely on yourselves during times of unprecedented change and uncertainty. Um, embrace uncertainty in your limited time here at Barnard. There has never been a better opportunity to embody Barnard's unofficial mantra and to, in fact, major in unafraid. Challenge yourselves to explore new areas of study. Take classes in departments you're unfamiliar with. Explore interests that are new to you. Found a student group that helps to hone a particular passion. Explore the city. Sign on to do research with a faculty member. Use your Barnard years as opportunity to pave a path that is uniquely yours. Trust in yourselves this year, perhaps more than ever before, while your preferred, ver preferred version of the future is in fact not promised. The future you build is most surely up to you. We find ourselves here today celebrating the start of an academic year that promises to be as close to normal as any that we have experienced in quite some time. We return to campus together as a community of learners and of scholars and with a grandly optimistic sense of the fullness of the academic year that lies ahead. As this is the first time I'm addressing the first year class formally, I offer my warmest welcome to you. And for our returning students, welcome back. It is so wonderful to see the campus yet again so full and bubbling. On behalf of myself and your distinguished faculty, we look forward, truly forward, to the academic year ahead, exceptional and full, as it most certainly will be. Thank you. Welcome.
Good afternoon. My name is Holly Tedder, and I serve as Dean for Academic Planning and Class Advising at the college. I joined Barnard in January 2019 as the director of the Center for Accessibility Resources and Disability Services. In my current role, I help to support academic advising programs and oversee the Dean's Office for advising and support, while continuing to support the college's programs for students with disabilities. I'm here today to bring greetings from the staff. Welcome to the new academic year. I hope that it will be an amazing year for you, regardless of where you are on your academic path. A special welcome to our new first year and transfer students and to our students who have recently returned from leave of absence. We are so happy you're here. Thinking about talking to you all today made me reflect on my own relationship with staff at my college. I went to Rollins College, a small liberal arts school in Florida. And what I've realized is I didn't really have a relationship with the staff at my college for the first two years. And those were difficult years for me. Not only was the college adjustment period hard, but I was dealing with changing family circumstances, navigating new friendships and relationships, and managing uncertainty about my academic goals. Then, in my junior year, I got involved with my college radio station, and things changed for me. I felt better connected to my campus and to my peers who worked with me to run the station. And I felt supported by our staff advisor who really got to know us as people and served as an amazing listener and sounding board. Without him, I wouldn't have had a trusted staff member who knew what I was dealing with outside of school, and he helped me land a summer on-campus job that I really needed. His support was invaluable to me, and I keep in touch with him to this day. I share this because I want you to know that you don't need to have connections with everyone on staff, and we don't expect you to. But even one connection can make a huge difference. It did for me. And here's what I know about the folks who work here, whether they're my colleagues in the Dean's office, in CARDS, at Beyond Barnard, at C, at Axis Barnard, or my colleagues who work at Furman, at the Wellness Spot, in the mail room, in dining services, in facilities, and everywhere else on campus. We care about your success and well-being. We want to get to know you and your personal and academic goals. Don't just reach out when you have a question or an issue. Tell us about your internships, your thesis ideas, that job you landed that you're excited about, or what you're grappling with when trying to decide on a major. But also, absolutely reach out to us if you're having an issue or are struggling in some way. We are here to help and support you. I wish you all a wonderful year at Barnard. Thank you. Hello, Barnard. My name is Tiffany Vo. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am the president of SGA, Barnard's Student Government Association. Yay! <laughs> I am excited to be with you all today, as this is the first time I've been back in this space since my own convocation in 2019. Being a Barnard student, really just a person during these past few years, has been unimaginable. And we still feel those effects to this day. The trauma and loss that every individual carries and as a collective human species will forever be present. That is something no amount of normalcy we can try to emulate will erase. However, we are currently in position with extraordinary years behind us for even more extraordinary years ahead, hopefully with a different context. I hope for a school year and beyond that brings the clarity we need that we may desperately want, but especially a clarity that is necessary for the growth of our individual selves and community. Upon returning to Barnard last year, I came in as a junior who had to leave the campus halfway through March 2020, not knowing I wouldn't return for over a year. I still felt like a brand new student. Despite the knowledge I had gained from virtual classrooms, which was supposed to equate me to being a third year college student, I came in with a lot of hesitancy. I was already exhausted at the thought of reacquainting myself with in-person social situations, as well as regaining my footing as a scholar. Weren't these things supposed to feel familiar to me? But a comforting thought, and what was constantly reminded to me and my peers, was that everyone is feeling similar combinations of mixed emotions. 
I leaned into the Barnard community and its resources, and it eventually brought me back to the core of why I initially chose to come to an educational institution like this. My favorite thing about Barnard has always been the people I get to meet and connect with here. Over these past few years, I've come to see and understand what it means to be resilient and unafraid. It is through our care of each other and ourselves. Barnard SGA has supported this sentiment in many ways, including providing support and advocacy for book students last year, allocating multiple SGA funds to sponsor the renovation of key student spaces like the Zora Neale Hurston Lounge, a student lounge dedicated to black Barnard students. We organized, purchased, and distributed chess binders for trans and gender nonconforming students. We successfully ratified our student government constitution with the highest voter turnout of the year and paved way for the compensation of labor by essential student leaders at Barnard. We also spearheaded a new tradition, Barnard's Earth Day Festival, highlighting the college's commitment to a more sustainable future. And we introduced an SGA curated newsletter, which centralized COVID-19 updates and policies at Barnard and Columbia. SGA has given me the opportunity to center myself in my interests and learn more from the Barnard community through advocating and coming up with creative solutions to address pertinent campus-wide issues. Your center could be through research, your studies, co-curricular activities. Barnard is the place where you discover this. I encourage you all to tap into the vast network of resources like our writing fellows, Beyond Barnard, and personal librarians. And so, to the class of 2026 20, and new transfer students, be gentle with yourselves in this new transition. You're here for a reason, and you'll come to find out that the power you bring coming into this school is not the other way around. It is what you bring coming in. To the class of 2025, your strength and perseverance to bettering yourselves and Barnard continue. As you start to pinpoint your paths further, know that you still have so much more time to learn and transform. To the class of 2024, you're halfway there, and somehow it can still feel like it hasn't been enough time to figure out who you're supposed to be at this point. The thing is, you're going to be doing that for the rest of your life. So ease into junior year and see where it takes you. And to my class, the class of 2023, we have had quite a time. As we ride off into our last hurrah, let us enjoy our second full year of being Barnard students on campus with the knowledge that we will forever be fully Barnard alums in the future. One last note before I finish. Viola Davis gave a commencement speech for the graduating class of 2019. And there has been one line that has stuck with me that I'd like to share. I quote, you are graduating from a school whose mission it is not to just hand you a diploma, but a sword. You either start wielding it or you put it away as a conversation piece. Our diplomas could very well be these metaphorical swords, but I also think there's a hidden sword we create and shape from our Barnard experiences and the knowledge we've gained from it. I can't wait to wield both of mine, and I hope you are too. Happy convocation and thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katarina Kaganovich, and I'm a part of the class of 2024. Hello, my name is Grace Boyan. I'm also in the class of 2024, and we are the co-chairs of the Bonnard Honor Board. Please join us in the recitation of the Honor Code. We, the students of Barnard College, resolve to uphold the honor of the college by engaging with integrity in our academic pursuits. We affirm that academic integrity is the honorable creation and presentation of our own work. We acknowledge that it is our responsibility to seek clarification of proper forms of collaboration and use of academic resources in all assignments or exams. We consider academic integrity to include the proper use and care for all print, electronic, or other academic resources. We will respect the rights of others to engage in pursuit of learning in order to uphold our commitment to honor. We pledge to do all that is in our power to create a spirit of honesty and honor for its own sake. Thank you.
Absolutely amazing. Good afternoon and welcome. Convocation is really an opportunity for celebration and inspiration, a singular chance to come together and help each other prepare for the excitement, the challenges, the success, and yes, the inevitable stumbles that we will all experience in the year ahead. But it's also an opportunity to stand back and assess where we are as individuals and as an institution. Students, as you probably know, you're not the same person you were when you first applied to college, whether you're first years or seniors, or even when you were accepted at Barnard. And for our staff and our faculty, we've all changed in the face of the challenges and opportunities of the last several years. And just like us, Barnard is not the same college it was a few years earlier, and it will continue to change and evolve as we do. Heraclitus was on to something when he said that you can't step in the same river twice. The same can be said of people. Students on a quest to learn and grow intellectually and personally, faculty who create and share knowledge, and staff who are dedicated to supporting our operations, finances, health and safety, and so much more. All of us are sources and recipients of change in our community. So rather than stand here today and tell our students all the ways they might change in college, although I do a little of that, I'm just as eager to focus on how you will change the college itself. Fortunately, Barnard is no stranger to being at the forefront of change. When women were excluded from most educational institutions in the 19th century, Barnard was founded as a place where they could learn, grow, and transform the world. And our alums have gone on to do exactly that, create spaces for women and underrepresented voices where perhaps none existed before. That is the legacy that informs all we do. But change isn't always easy or expeditious or done right. Yes, Barnard was founded as a place for women, but the first black women didn't enroll until 1925. There were also de facto quotas for the number of Jewish students and other ethnic groups at the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of change was needed at Barnard since its founding, and more change is still needed today. As president, one of my main goals has been to carry this legacy of change in all that we do as an institution. Most strongly, our curriculum reflects that spirit of change. Several years ago, our faculty reworked the curriculum with an eye towards changing the landscape of higher education and the knowledge that our students needed more and different skills as they graduated. We now ask all of our students to take courses which allow them to think locally, globally, equitably, historically, empirically, and technologically. Foundations that our faculty view as critical regardless of your post-graduation plans. And this year, once again, our faculty will embark on a review of that curriculum, asking what should change, what should be updated. But faculty don't wait six years to evolve our curriculum. It happens all the time. Two great examples, through a partnership between Professor Rebecca Wright, who's the director of the Vagilis Computational Center and a Druckenmiller Professor of Computer Science, and Dr. Jennifer Rosales, Vice President for Inclusion and Engaged Learning and Chief Diversity Officer, we uh, launched the 
computational science fellows. It's really a new program that epitomizes the multidisciplinary approach we need to enhance the recruitment and retention of women and underrepresented voices in computing. Or another example, the Caribbean Digital Scholarship Collective led by Professor Kayama Glover, funded last year by a $5 million grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. This collective is designed to study immigration, climate change, and diversity through the lens of Caribbean scholarship, a project that is enhanced by Barnard being of a city as diverse and multicultural as New York. I could give countless other examples of how our curriculum, pedagogy, and research continues to evolve. To put it simply, I believe we're constantly pushing Barnard to be what psychologists Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy call a deliberately developmental organization. And yes, I always quote a psychologist when I give a talk. A deliberately developmental organization is one that banks on fostering personal risk-taking and self-improvement for the benefit of all. They write that a deliberately developmental organization creates a culture in which people could see their mistakes, not as vulnerabilities, but as a prime opportunities for personal growth. Kagan and Leahy explain that people grow through the proper combination of challenge and support, which includes recognizing and transcending their blind spots, limitations, and internal resistance to change. They remind us to seek constructive destabilization, an environment that poses challenges and then helps us work through those challenges to grow our potential. Our aim and hope at Barnard is that we are always developing in an environment in which stretching yourself is more rewarded than playing it safe. And it comes with risk, I get that, a culture where flux and change are actually part of the status quo. But both as a college president and a cognitive scientist, I think the evidence is pretty clear. There's tremendous power in doing things you've never seen yourself doing before. Stretching your minds and your ambitions take you to different places, personally, emotionally, academically, and professionally, than sticking in your comfort zone. Granted, it's scarier and the path forward may contain a few more dips and turns, but training your mind is a lot like training your muscle. You have to continue to push to grow. The results, the results of this developmental environment are clear. Every day, our faculty, staff, and students change Barnard and the world around it. Whether it's Professor Erica Kitzmiller helping educators address learning delays caused by the pandemic, or Student Government Association always pushing on administrators for extra resources and support to enhance the student experience. We do this by growing together. And we're also improving our physical environment too. Our now iconic Milstein Center for Teaching and Learning was opened in 2018, and I think it continues to be a premier hub for academic, technological, and other activities. Next on the docket, the renovation expansion of our science building, Alshul Hall, which will be transformed into the Roy and Diana Vagelo Science Center, and the Francine A. Lefrac Foundation Center for Wellbeing, which we're looking forward to starting construction on this year. The Wellbeing Center will serve as a hub for health and wellness in our daily lives, and it really allows us to advance an integral tenet of our mission. Our mission says that we will hold our students to rigorous academic standards, and also will give them the support they need to meet those standards. I would argue this is true for faculty, staff, and even administrators. They need support too, which is why we're focusing well-being for all members of our community. I believe so strongly in the power of the physical environment that I actually wrote a book about it called How the Body Knows Its Mind. It's all about how thinking systematically about how we work, how we play, how we exercise our body and our mind can lead us to do what we want to do better academically, professionally, and personally. As many of you know, this is my last year as president of Barnard. And as my tenure comes to a close, Barnard as an organization continues to develop because that's just who we are. Whether it's the change that awaits the next, the next president that's selected, or whether it's the personal changes that await all of us as we find our own place within our incredible community, I ask you to embrace some of that fear, anxiety that comes along with it. And this isn't just pat advice either. My research has actually shown that anxiety often triggers the same areas of the brain that are involved in physical pain responses. But we also know that by focusing on positive outcomes, 
reminding ourselves of how we've successfully conquered our anxiety in the past, even taking a break for exercise, mindful meditation, can help us focus our attention and our efforts and quiet our mind. And our faculty are here to support you and our staff as well every step of the process. One final note, as we all go through changes this year, please remember to be kind to yourself and to each other. As we grow as an institution and a community, we recognize our individual successes, but also our missteps. This is all part of our journey, one of continual intellectual, professional, emotional, and moral improvement. I can't wait to share my last year at Barnard with you. I wish you all the best of luck. It is now my pleasure to introduce our convocation speaker, an author and journalist who has jumped from success to success by always pushing beyond her comfort zone, Ayana Bird from the Barnard class of 1995. Ayana didn't come to Barnard expecting to become a leading voice and expert on the politics and culture of black women's hair. But after cutting off her chemically straightened hair as a sophomore, she set out to talk with other black women on campus about what their hair meant to them. This sparked her to write the collection of essays that ultimately led to her first book, Hair Story, Untangling the Roots of Black Hair in America. She's written several more books since then, including a children's book. Always a risk taker, after years as a journalist, Ayana made a change. She discovered a love for fiction and earned her Master's of Fine Arts in the subject. Ayana is currently writing her first novel and has also leapt into television writing, quickly getting invited to be part of the writer's room of the Amazon series Harlem. Unfortunately, Ayana allowed me to share with you that she tested positive for COVID-19 and can't be here today, and we're all thinking about her and wishing her a speedy recovery. And in the spirit of change, Jamila Chisholm, a close friend of Ayana's and the director of the creative content here at Barnard, will be reading Ayana's remarks on her behalf. Jamila is a prized member of our community and is accomplished journalist, educator, and author of The Community, a memoir. Jamila has appeared in the New York Times, and her writing has been published by BET, Color Lines, Essence, Time's Up, and other companies and publications. Jamila represents the best of our community, creative, nimble, and ready to adapt to the unexpected. Please join me in welcoming Jamila. Dear members of the Barnard community, President Bylock, Provost Bell, Dean Greenwich, students, faculty, and staff, it is my honor to join in this beautiful celebration for the start of this semester as representative for my very dear friend, Ayana Bird. Before I read Ayana's keynote speech, I want to share some brief thoughts about our friendship and how, simply by being around her, I too learned the Barnard way of perseverance with the help of community. I cannot tell you the first time that I met Yanni, as she is affectionately known, because I felt like we were always friends. Yanni's career was one I watched with glee, as she seemed a step ahead of mostly everyone else. When she published her first book, I was just starting my own journalism career. A few years later, she published her second book, Naked, Black women bear all about their skin, hair, hips, lips, and other parts. Just 10 years out of college, and Yanni had published two books. Without Yanni, I'm not sure I would have survived the MFA program we both completed together. But we graduated thanks to the sense of community she created for many of us in the program, and that she continues to cultivate. When I published my memoir, The Community, this past June, it was Yanni's blurb that appeared on my book's cover. Yanni is a friend who will prop you up emotionally when needed and act as a mental tugboat when you feel as though you're sinking. As she's moved from journalism to writing for television and fiction to her first novel, she continues to inspire me. Being Yanni's friend will motivate you to succeed. I know this firsthand. If all of that doesn't say enough about her character, Yanni automatically said yes when I asked if she would work with me to help edit and write creative content for Barnard's website. 
She loves this college. And as someone who has spent more years on this campus than the four total I spent on my own undergraduate campus, I understand why Yanni remains dedicated to Barnard. So while I'm saddened that Yanni could not be here in person to deliver her speech, I am beyond honored to share it with you in her absence. May her words and love for this college invigorate you all, whether you're a first year or a senior or any class in between, to cultivate community and to take what Barnard has given you to inspire others as Yanni continues to inspire me. Here's her speech. I am very excited to be here at the beginning of your academic year and so honored that Barnard invited me to share convocation with you. When I was 17, I had to make a decision that you all also have to make. Where was I going to go to college? I was the first person in my family to attend and my mother only had one request, don't apply in Philadelphia, where I was from. She believed that if I was going to do something as big as college, do it in a big way, go someplace new, create a new life in a new place. That meant that if I listened to my mom, minus Philadelphia and its suburbs, I had the whole world as a possibility. That could have felt overwhelming, but I knew where I was going, Atlanta, to be an English major at Spelman College. <laughs> Yet, three months after graduating high school, I arrived in Morningside Heights, a first year at Barnard, who became a political science major. It was the last thing I had expected to do and one of the best unexpected decisions of my life. I applied to Barnard so I could have options just in case. And yes, I got into Spelman, but I also got an Amtrak ticket from Barnard to visit campus after being accepted. A weekend in New York? Absolutely. I got here thinking I'd have fun, go home, that's it. But then I walked through the gates, met my hosts, sat on the lawn and talked to more students. And I felt what I'm sure many of you have felt, the pull of Barnard. The power of being around so many brilliant, confident women, energized even more by the electricity of New York City. Before the first day was over, I knew I wanted to be a part of this. But I had known since the third grade that I wanted to be a journalist and never questioned that I'd be an English major. Until I saw the course offerings and suddenly wasn't so sure English was for me. Since I had until sophomore year to declare, I decided to try everything that felt interesting and didn't require being in class at 9 a.m. on a Friday. Take note. Psychology, environmental science, French, sociology, history, English, creative writing, and political science. While I was experimenting, I learned something that you will also learn in your classes. Barnard centers women and women's stories, no matter the subject. It seems obvious we are more than half of the world's population. Of course, our stories and voices are everywhere, but that was hardly the case in my high school, and it wasn't what my friends at other schools were experiencing. Learning about history, science, politics, and literature in a way that centered women changed me. I felt expanded. I felt curious, and discovering these women made me feel I could do whatever I wanted. College is one of the only times in your life when you are asked, what do you want to do? And an entire institution then supports your answer. What did I want to do? I decided I wanted to study uprisings, elections, and grassroots activism how people who were told to stay still and stay quiet got up, got organized, got loud, and changed the world. I chose to major in political science with a minor in American history so I could focus on the civil rights, black power, and women's movements. There was something else I wanted to do while I was in college. Look cute. And my mother made it clear that she would pay for college in New York 
but not college and salon visits to keep my chemically straightened hair. I knew my talents, and they did not include applying chemicals to my scalp. So, thinking I was being thrifty, I swatted, swapped my mid-back length straight hair for a two-inch little afro. I went natural in 1992, before it was called going natural, before there was a natural hair movement, before there was public conversation around beauty ideals, white supremacy, and black women. But just because it wasn't a conversation didn't mean it wasn't a reality. One I felt starting as soon as I stepped outside of the salon, minus what I'd never realized was my security blanket. Something that I thought was as straightforward as a haircut was now impacting my self-confidence. And I couldn't make sense of what was happening, but whatever it was, it was taking up most of my mental space. What does any of this have to do with Barnard? Everything. Because at Barnard, we are encouraged to explore what doesn't sit right with us, to ask questions, and to dig for the answers, but to also study the systems, the thinking, the ideologies that are behind the answers we find. This was a time when a number of feminists were exploring the oppressiveness of beauty culture and connecting women's desires to feel beautiful and the narrow ways beauty was defined with patriarchy and capitalism. But at that time, few were connecting it to racism. Had that connection been made, I would have quickly known why my haircut was so much more than a haircut. But there was no book or article that I could turn to to explain how I was feeling. Barnard, though, had already shown me that just because something wasn't in a book, didn't mean there wasn't an explanation. I started talking to black women that I knew about their hair and skin, what made them feel beautiful, and what told them they were not. And I thought of Naomi Wolf's book, Beauty Myth, where she talked about the Iron Maiden, which was what she called society's expectations and assumptions about women's bodies and appearances. I thought of Susan Bordo, a feminist philosopher who wrote about the unbearable weight of beauty ideals. And I took their theories and ideas and wove in what black women were telling me and what I knew to be true for myself about the dangerous mix of beauty, misogyny, and white supremacy. Because of that one haircut, I began decades of work on black women and beauty culture. I'm happy to say that not only did Barnard support this from an intellectual place, which it did, but also from a financial one. At the time, the college had the Centennial Scholars Program. Today, it's called the Barbara Silver Horowitz Class of 55 Scholars of Distinction Program. In it, a small number of students in each graduating class are invited to do a project that spans their time at Barnard, anything of their choice, where they work with a faculty advisor and get a stipend to use however they see fit. My Centennial Scholars project was on black women and hair. I worked with Natalie Campen, who was the chair of the Women's Studies Department, an art historian, and one of my favorite people on campus because of the discussions we'd have and the way she encouraged me to create a series of essays and a panel discussion on black hair culture. Six years after I graduated, I published my first book titled Hair Story a social history on black hair in America that would have never happened without my Barnard project. Neither would my second book, titled Naked, which was an anthology of essays by black women about body image. While at Barnard, I think I read every book that the library had on body image, and what I kept noticing was that few included black women these books pretended that our stories, bodies, and relationships to our bodies was no different from white women's, whose stories filled these books. But of course, there was a difference. Because as black women, we lived in a nation, in a world, that had been devaluing and brutalizing black bodies for centuries. Barnard, of course, provided me with the tangible things I needed to know to do those books. How to do research, how to write better, 
more convincing sentences, how to set and stick to deadlines. But more than those things, it taught me that what I thought was important was. It gave me the confidence to know that just because someone hadn't done something before, I could. My undergraduate education taught me that I was a capable, creative, curious woman who could go out and do what I wanted to do, because I wanted to do it. That sounds like ad copy for a brochure, but I promise you, when I look back, when you look back on your time here, you will know that it is very much the truth. And no matter how many years it's been since you graduated, you will keep meeting other alums whose brains and boldness awe you. I was lucky to live with four of these women during college. My senior year, I lived in Suite 34 of Barnard Dorm, 620 West 116th Street. My roommates were Asali, Evan, Claire, and Alicia, who I'd been friends with since first year. 27 years later, we still, thanks to smartphones, talk every day. And our text thread is called Sweet 34. We are a TV news political producer who is also a political science major and obsessed with the Christian right, but for people who are really talking about it, whose senior thesis essentially predicted the rise of the Tea Party, an opera singer and composer, who I decided I wanted to be friends with on my first day at Barnard at a dorm floor meeting because she said, quote, I used to want to be an ice skater, but then decided to become an opera singer. And I didn't think I'd ever heard something so unexpected and awesome. She has since created and performed works that combine the two. A novelist whose first book made her a National Book Award honoree but who had been writing short stories and sharing them with Sweet 34 since always. And a public and community health activist whose work is focused on women and sexual health, who used to leave glass bowls of condoms at the front door of our suite for visitors and regularly sit at the dining table sorting through a collection of dental dams before going off to give a talk on safe sex as a peer educator and me, an author, journalist, and TV writer. Every single one of us got on the paths we are on today at Barnard. I told Sweet 34 I was speaking at Convocation and asked what we would have wanted to know when we began at Barnard. The novelist kept us short and said, practice safe sex and put down your phone. <laughs> true and true. Someone else said, it's okay to feel uncertain, anxious, and to embrace the unresolved as an opportunity to unlearn and dismantle what brings you and your communities down. Practice being gentle with yourself and others and lean into New York and sisterhood. Another told me, don't be afraid to swerve if your plans, your goals, your major, etc aren't planning out as you'd hoped or expected. It's great that the resources and boys of Columbia are available, but there's something very special about attending a women's college. Don't lose sight of that and make an effort to involve yourself in a community of women. It's not a situation you'll often find yourself in again. I agree with everything that they said minus the last sentence. A community of women is not a situation you'll find yourself in again. I disagree, because I don't know anyone who attended Barnard who was still not friends, and more than friends, family, with people they met during school. There is a community here that will welcome you and make you laugh and let you cry when you lose a paper from a computer glitch the night after it was due, true story, and be there for you through heartbreak, births, deaths, successes, things that look like failures, but we're really just making room for next. Barnard may have been my first unexpected next, but it wasn't the last one. As we live through a pandemic, we all know that sometimes life can happen in ways that are unimaginable. And in each of those times, we have to figure out who we are, what we believe in, and how we are going to move forward and whether that is in step or very much out of step 
with those around us. Barnard provided me with what I needed to do. In some cases, it was the actual book knowledge. In others, it was the confidence in myself as a woman to ask the questions, to do the research, sit, process, and then act accordingly. And Barnard also taught me how to create many people, what many people may think of as the unimaginable. When I was 45, I decided I was going to become a single mother by choice. Was it a scary decision to make considering my lack of a partner or a trust fund? Terrifying. But for all the babies can be terrifying reasons. Not for the society says families are supposed to look a certain way and new mothers are supposed to be a certain age reasons. When those fears started to show up, I reached back as far as Barnard to make them go away. Two classes where we talked about social constructs of the family and how institutions that support the patriarchy support us believing in these social constructs. But that they are just that, constructs, constructs, used to keep women in the home or underpaid or unsure. I remembered what I had learned and I became and stayed sure and at 46, I became a mom to a little boy who I am determined to raise to know that just because the media or the Supreme Court says something is a certain way does not mean that it should be that way if it denies people who have been forced to the margins what they need to have bodily autonomy and social and financial opportunity. I'd like to think I'm going to raise him to be a free thinker. But the truth is that I'd really like him to be a Barnard thinker. Today, I would like to congratulate you for the choices that led you to becoming a Barnard thinker and wish you an amazing, curiosity-filled academic year. Happy convocation. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Greenwich, and I'm honored to serve as Dean of the College. Convocation is such a special part of the academic year, although often filled with mixed emotions. While many of us may feel trepidation about change as the summer turns to fall, as we feel hints of coolness in the air replacing the humidity we had just grown accustomed to, and as it takes a bit longer for the sun to rise in the mornings. We are comforted in this gathering by the hope of newness that an academic year brings. As we settle into the familiar rhythm of the fall semester, or for those new to Barnard, settle into this new experience, we're reminded of the individual and collective accomplishments that have brought us this far. We can reflect on how we've persevered through challenging times. We are comforted by the knowledge that we are exactly where we need to be and that we have the tools we need to succeed. And we are encouraged in knowing that we will learn more along the way in preparation for the journeys and experiences that are yet to come. History has taught us that we will be okay. And so to our first years, the class of 2026, and to our new transfer students, I welcome you again to Barnard and to this next exciting step in your lives. A few weeks ago, I encouraged you all to have a plan, to be prepared for that plan to change, to not be afraid to learn with and from others, to be patient with yourself, to celebrate your wins, to give credit where credit is due, and to make time for fun. I hope that in the weeks since your arrival, you've been able to exercise at least one of those, hopefully the make time for fun part. And I trust that as you embark on this academic journey, you will find more opportunities to employ each of them. To the sophomores, you begin this year much differently than you did your first year. The world and our campus is more open. My sincerest hope is that where you felt limited or stalled last year, you instead feel free to explore and engage in ways you may not have fully understood possible last fall not only because our campus is more open, but because you have experience behind you that prepares you to navigate this academic year. To the juniors, now's the time to chart your path if you haven't already done so, knowing that you can receive guidance from older classmates 
and serve as role models to your younger peers. You should think in earnest about what more you want to learn, how you can contribute to the Barnard community, and what and who you want to be in your final two years here. Junior year positions you uniquely to serve as guides, leaders, and examples to those who come after you while still absorbing all that you can from those ahead of you. Take advantage of that particular sweet spot. To the seniors, the class of 2023, a class that I often refer to as my class. Sorry, Tiffany. We started our Barnard journeys a mere few weeks apart from one another. When I greeted you during your orientation, I encouraged you to be aware of the, worry, of the way you use the word just, to be certain that you weren't using it in a way that diminished the very things that made you different, unique, and characteristically you, to be certain that you weren't using it in ways that cheated yourself out of opportunities that you should explore, to be certain that you weren't using it in a way that allowed others to devalue integral aspects of your identity. And so as you embark on your final year, after a time that none of us could have imagined in August 2019, I hope you are able to use the last three years at Barnard to tell your story in a way that makes it clear that you are not just a college student, that you are not just someone who navigated one of the most unexpected college experiences that one could have, but that you have a story to tell and lessons learned that prepare you to be a change maker, an influencer, and a valued contributor, no matter what you do in life post Barnard. Finally, to the faculty and staff. It feels like I say it every year, but I mean it more and more each time. I am truly honored to call all of you my colleagues. We are so privileged in our jobs to pour into each other but more importantly, to pour into every single Barnard student. I'm so honored to do this work with you each and every day. My hope for all of us as we begin this year is that we don't lose sight of the joy that our work brings or the responsibility we have to directly or indirectly shape the future by the work we get to do every day with our amazing Barnard students. Thank you for your work and for your collegiality. May we all, students, faculty, and staff, have a wonderful academic year. Thank you. President Bylock, it has been an outstanding day. I now have the distinct honor of declaring this convocation ceremony adjourned. Thank you. 
On behalf of my fellow faculty and all who hold education in the highest regard, we wish everyone much success this academic year and look forward to all that is to come. I extend a warm invitation to each of you to return to Barnard's campus for the block party. But first, we ask that you remain seated until the platform party and the faculty have recessed. Thank you for being here and good afternoon.